Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we like to say. My name is David Welch, and I'm the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and also a senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation. I'd like to thank CG's public events sponsor, Woodsworth Books, for its ongoing support for making our public events a success. Besides the audience here in the auditorium tonight, we have a global audience uh, watching on a live webcast. And following this evening's uh, program, we will welcome questions from the audience, either at the microphones that you see on either side of the room here, or you can ask questions via the live chat function on your screen if you're watching by webcast. And we'll transmit those questions to our guests on stage. Tonight, we are delving deeply into the challenging and controversial principle of the responsibility to protect, or R2P, as we like to call it. As Canadians, when we hear the phrase R2P, we often recall the significant role that our government played, and in particular, the role of our distinguished foreign minister, the Honorable Lloyd Axworthy, in promoting the concept of the responsibility to protect and seeing that it become embraced by the United Nations as a formal principle to which all member states committed in 2005. As global citizens, when we hear the phrase R2P, we often think of instances where the international community failed humanity by turning a blind eye. Rwanda, for example, or became engaged and involved on moral grounds, but not without controversy. NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia over the issue of Kosovo comes to mind. R2P represents perhaps the single most dramatic revision of the nearly 500-year-old Westphalian concept of state sovereignty, which was premised on the idea that what happens inside a state is the business of that state and only of that state. As a result of R2P, non-interference in the domestic affairs of a state is no longer something to which governments are entitled, but something that they must earn. But important questions remain. When does the responsibility to protect kick in? What form should it take in a particular context? Who bears it? What are the obstacles to implementation? These are not only important questions, but these are timely ones, especially in the light of recent events in Syria, where the regime has clearly failed in its responsibility to protect and where the international community has not yet, in any obvious way, stepped into the breach. Tonight we will hear from an internationally recognized expert on R2P who will help us understand how the principle has evolved and what we can expect of it in the years to come. Dr. Jennifer Welsh is Professor in International Relations at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of Somerville College. In July 2013, Jennifer was appointed uh, consultant, sorry, appointed a special advisor for the responsibility to protect to the UN Secretary General uh, at the Assistant Secretary General level. Born in Regina, Saskatchewan, she's former Jean Monnet Fellow of the European University Institute in Florence and was a Cadieux Research Fellow in the policy planning staff of the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs. She's taught international relations at the University of Toronto, McGill University, and the Central European University in Prague. She served as a consultant to the Government of Canada on international policy and acts as a frequent commentator on foreign policy and international affairs generally. She has a BA from the University of Saskatchewan and a master's and doctorate from the University of Oxford, where she studied as a Rhodes Scholar. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Welsh. Thanks very much, and thank you so much for welcoming 
me to Waterloo, where I haven't been in, in around six or seven years, and it's always amazing to see how much changes each different year you come to Waterloo. While Canada has a treasured and well-earned reputation for peacekeeping, it also has a century-old history of participation in war. Canada's Book of Glory, as French Marshal Ferdinand Falk, former Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe, once referred to it, begins with World War I, an event whose centenary we will mark in the coming year. Most of us will have learned about the bravery and sacrifice of Canadian soldiers in 1917 at, at Vimy. We will have learned about this in our high school years, and some of us may even have visited the vast stone edifice that overlooks the Dewey Plain in northern France, designed by the renowned sculptor and architect W.S. Allward. But Canada's history of war actually began two years earlier, when battalions of the 1st Canadian Division, who were hastily assembled in the summer of 1914, helped hold the line against the Germans in the Second Battle of Ypres. On April 22nd, 1915, the Germans released 160 tons of chlorine gas, filling the trenches and forcing Allied troops to climb out into enemy fire. Over 6,000 French and colonial soldiers died within minutes. Through a flooding of the lungs, some have described as a sensation similar to drowning, but on dry land. The survivors fled en masse, leaving a huge four-mile opening in the defenses and transforming the village of St. Julian, which had been comfortably in the rear of the 1st Canadian Division, into the new front line. As one observer recounted, one cannot blame them that they broke and fled. In the gathering dark of that awful night, they fought with terror, running blindly in the gas cloud and dropping with breasts, heaving in agony, and the slow poison of suffocation mantling their dark faces. Hundreds of them fell and died. Others lay helpless, froth upon their agonized lips, and their racked bodies powerfully sick with tearing nausea at short intervals. They too would die later, a slow and lingering death of agony unspeakable. German troops were unprepared for the staggering effects of the gas attacks, and they failed to fill the gap immediately. The Canadians took advantage of the delay, urinated into their handkerchiefs to counter the effects of the chemicals, and held part of the line against further attacks for 48 hours until reinforcements appeared. The fighting around St. Julien led to Canada's first ever Victoria Cross, the most prestigious medal for gallantry, which was awarded to 20-year-old Lance Corporal Frederick Fisher from the 13th Battalion Machine Gun Detachment. It was also during Canada's participation in the Second Battle of Ypres that John Alexander McRae, a lieutenant colonel from Guelph, Ontario, wrote the iconic poem in Flanders Fields. Now, as the belligerent countries of World War I, including Canada, re remember the horrors of that conflict, it's also important to reflect on how the nature and conduct of armed conflict has changed fundamentally over the past century. This past August, the world had the opportunity to witness another deadly attack involving chemical weapons. In the Ghouta area of Damascus, families who thought they were fleeing to the basement of buildings to avoid attack were tragically exposed to sarin nerve gas sent into this suburb through surface-to-surface -surface rockets. In their report to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, UN inspectors drew on testimony from over 50 exposed survivors who experienced shortness of breath, disorientation, blurred vision, nausea, vomiting, and loss of consciousness. But they were actually the lucky ones. There's debate over the numbers who died, but the most significant point is that they were not conscripted soldiers like those in World War I. They were civilians. Following the attacks, the leaders of several Western states, most notably the United States, declared their willingness to use military force to respond to the use of these indiscriminate weapons, 
and to deter future war crimes that would violate the principle of civilian immunity. As I stand here tonight, the prospect of such an attack remains uncertain. Diplomacy has been given its chance. But whatever the outcome of the Syrian civil war or of the U.S. pledge to leave open the option of military action, the rhetoric of states reflects a significant change in the landscape of international affairs. Whereas conflicts in previous centuries were about states attempting to gain territory or resources or defend themselves against an act of aggression by another state, many contemporary uses of military force have one of their central purposes, the protection of individuals' physical security. The NATO-led action in Libya in 2011 is the culmination of this trend, but a number of military interventions have been launched over the past two decades, whether in Somalia in 1992 or Kosovo or East Timor, with the aim of protecting innocent individuals from harm. These humanitarian interventions, as they're sometimes called, call upon soldiers to risk their lives not to defend their country or to punish an aggressor, but to save innocent strangers from harm that is often being perpetrated by their own governments. So how did we get here? World War I was the culmination of an era of great power rivalry. The states of Europe had been locked into a rigid alliance system with commitments to assist one another in the event of attack which dragged them into a four-year conflict that decimated the fighting age male populations of their societies. When the preeminent non-European power, the United States, entered the conflict in 1917, it was to battle against the ascendancy of German autocracy and restore the delicate equi equilibrium among states that had existed on the European continent. Although another intervention by the US would be required less than 30 years later, to counteract a second German bid for hegemony, the period after World War I sowed the seeds for one of the most dramatic changes in the nature of war that we've seen over the past century, the outlawing of aggression by one state against another. Prior to 1914, the right of war, or what was referred to as the competence de guerre, remained an undisputed hallmark of sovereign power. And as part of this general license given to states, there was no international criminal jurisdiction with respect to war, meaning that after the conclusion of hostilities, states effectively agreed to a reciprocal amnesty for acts perpetrated during war. However, the subsequent 30 years witnessed a rapid inversion of the presumed legality of interstate war. For political elites and the general publics of the participating states of World War I, the enormous destruction and wanton cruelties perpetrated in the course of the conflict made it evident that the rule of license to wage war could not continue. And in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference, the possibility of the criminalization of aggressive war was entertained for the first time in the form of a proposal to try the ex-German Kaiser Wilhelm II. Even though the conference ultimately elected not to pursue his prosecution, it nevertheless charged the Kaiser with the supreme offense against international morality and sanctity of treaties. In 1920, the Covenant of the League of Nations imposed strict limits on the exercise of the competence de guerre, and in 1928, the Kellogg-Briand Pact placed that competence beyond the capacity of states. Now, of course, the outbreak of the Second World War, so soon after, exposed in sharp relief the unsustainability of such a weak prohibition on the use of force. And furthermore, the atrocious violations of international law perpetrated by the forces of Nazi Germany underlined for many the need for an effective international criminal jurisdiction capable of punishing such outrages. And so the gradual process of outlawing aggressive war reached its apogee on August 8, 1945, when the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, United States, and France concluded the London Agreement, which criminalized aggressive war and provided for the trial of Nazi leaders guilty of this crime. The UN Charter, also signed in 1945, reinforced this new climate with its Article 
which declared that all members shall ref refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. Now under international law, states were permitted to use force in self-defense against an armed attack or as part of collective security authorized by the UN Security Council. But while offensive or aggressive war had been deemed both illegal and uncivilized, views concerning the use of force for other purposes gradually evolved. The Charter didn't explicitly give states permission to use military force in response to humanitarian crises. But its framers, the Charter framers, were not immune to human rights considerations given their recent experience of the Holocaust. The strong human rights commitments enshrined in the preamble and Article 55 of the Charter provided some space for later arguments in favor of military interventions with a humanitarian purpose. And these, and the, and these openings were accompanied by developments in international humanitarian law, most notably the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. On the other side of the ledger, however, the post-1945 period also saw the rapid expansion in the number of states in the international system as former colonies gained their independence. And for these new members of international society, emphasis was given to other parts of the UN Charter, such as the commitment to sovereign equality, respect for self-determination, and Article 2.7, the article which demands non-interference in the domestic jurisdiction of states. And while the Security Council, in theory, always had the power to authorize responses to what it deemed to be a threat to international peace and security, throughout the Cold War, it proved reluctant to interpret massive human rights violations as constituting such a threat. This all began to change beginning in 1991, with the effort to protect Kurds in northern Iraq at the end of the first Gulf War, when the Security Council showed an increased willingness and capacity to address violations of international uh, humanitarian law through forceful means. And this more expansive reading of the Council's powers generated a series of missions designed to ameliorate the plight of innocent civilians caught up in armed conflict. The circumstances in which the Council authorized action varied a great deal, including civil war, the collapse of state institutions, and state-led oppression. And so did the degree of success in achieving beneficial humanitarian outcomes. But after two decades in which humanitarian rationale featured regularly in Security Council debates, it was more difficult to argue that individual suffering inside the boundaries of a member state was not a legitimate subject of international concern. Running alongside this evolution in the practice of the Security Council was a more deliberate attempt by a series of high-profile individuals spearheaded by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to mobilize support for a more conditional interpretation of sovereignty and by implication greater legitimacy for the use of force to protect individuals. The broad backdrop for their efforts, efforts was a more permissive environment for intervention, resulting from a variety of developments, including the strengthening of human rights principles, the global and instantaneous access to information through the so-called CNN effect, the increased impact of refugee flows on neighboring societies. The entrepreneurship of figures like Annan was also aided by two pivotal cases from the 1990s, which affected the climate of opinion with respect to intervention for humanitarian purposes. On the one hand, the late and wholly inadequate response of the international community to the genocide in Rwanda led to calls of never again. On the other hand, the 1999 NATO bombing of Serbia designed to prevent ethnic cleansing in the Kosovo, occurred without Security Council authorization and created damaging divisions within the international community. Kofi Annan sought to avoid both of these scenarios by urging member states of the UN to rethink their rights and responsibilities. The Canadian-sponsored commission 
on intervention and state sovereignty responded to Annan's challenge with its report of 2001, The Responsibility to Protect. The key contribution of that commission was to transform the previous discourse about the rights of interveners into a victim-centered dialogue about the responsibilities of states to protect their populations and the international community to fill the gap when states failed to protect. Underpinning the recommendations of the commissioners was the assumption that the rights and privileges associated with sovereignty, like non-intervention, had become conditional on the willingness and capacity of the state to provide for the safety and well-being of individuals within its territory. The early reception of the responsibility to protect was mixed. To begin with, the principle was released in the autumn of 2001, hardly, as you'll no doubt remember, an ideal moment for a discussion of anything beyond international terrorism. The subsequent war against Iraq in 2003, whose protagonists eventually used humanitarian justifications after the original case for intervention based on weapons of mass destruction fell apart, almost killed support for the fledgling principle of the responsibility to protect because it confirmed the suspicions of many developing countries that responsibility to protect, or R2P, was just a new label for the old and familiar practice of great power intervention. In addition to these challenging factors in the context of international affairs, the formulation of the responsibility to protect in that original ICAS report had three ambiguities which made it much more difficult to implement the principle. First, the trigger for international action was large-scale loss of life, whether real or apprehended. But this left unclear, however, exactly what circumstances the label of R2P was intended to cover. Did it encompass only intentional killing, or also, for example, widespread human rights violations short of violent death, or deaths that occurred through natural disasters. Second, the source of the international responsibility was not clearly defined. Where did the responsibility come from? Did it derive from law or from broader ideas of morality? The members of the commission expressly avoided the idea of legal obligations, suggesting that R2P was for them predominantly a moral imperative. And finally, the ICAS report didn't distribute or allocate the international responsibility to any particular agent, referring only generally to the so-called international community. But this left unclear precisely who bears the international responsibility to protect. It created a collective action problem in which states could shirk their obligations. If no one is responsible, particularly, then no one would act. Now, despite the continuing debate over responsibility to protect, heads of state and government endorsed a version of the principle at the 2005 anniversary summit of the United Nations. Article 138 of the summit outcome document acknowledges the responsibility of individual sovereign states to protect their own populations from four acts, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing and to prevent both their commission and incitement. The subsequent paragraph, Article 139, endows the international community, working through the UN, with the responsibility to take collective action on a case-by-case -case basis using diplomatic, humanitarian, and if necessary, forceful means in situations where national authorities are manifestly failing to protect their populations. This paragraph also affirmed the commitment of the international community to assist states in building the capacity to protect their populations. So in many ways, the text of this summit outcome document clarified some of the ambiguities around the original notion. During the 2005 negotiations, states insisted on focusing the scope of R2P on four specific crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. This list was similar to those crimes which had been identified in both the 1998 Rome Statute and the 2001 Constitutive Act 
of the African Union. So today, the scope of the responsibility to protect is narrower but clearer. And this narrower reading, while still controversial to those who believe that other violations of human rights should trigger the principle, has quickly become the settled interpretation within the United Nations system. So, for example, after Cyclone Nargis wreaked its devastation in Myanmar in 2008, and some commentators tried to claim that the government's slow provision of humanitarian assistance constituted a crime against humanity, China and other ASEAN countries strongly opposed any attempt to coerce states into accepting humanitarian assistance. They insisted that responsibility to protect, as defined in 2005, was not applicable to natural disasters, a view that was shared by many high-level officials within the UN who worried about damaging the fragile consensus on the principle. As Gareth Evans, the former foreign minister of Australia, who's been one of the strongest advocates of R2P, put it, if R2P is about protecting everybody from everything, it will end up protecting nobody from anything. The summit also addressed the ambiguities surrounding the source and the bearer of the international responsibility to protect. The principle is grounded in a political commitment expressed by states in 2005 rather than a new legal obligation. Kofi Annan himself insisted that his goal was not to develop new law but to strengthen states' existing legal obligations. And Annan's understanding resonated with a variety of states, which for very different reasons opposed the crystallization of the principle into a new law to prevent and respond. This included several developing countries who were still wary of the responsibility to protect for fear that it would erode sovereignty, but also the United States under the leadership of the Bush administration's ambassador to the UN, John Bolton. The United States was uneasy about creating new legal obligations that might reduce America's sovereign right to decide upon the use of force. As a result of, this misgivings, of these misgivings, Article 139 speaks of states being prepared to take collective action on a case-by-case -case basis through the prevailing mechanisms of collective security that we have set out in the UN Charter, namely the political negotiations within the Security Council. So the responsibility to protect does not create new legal rights and obligations, but rather represents an authoritative interpretation by states of key elements of the UN Charter and stands a significant, as a significant reminder to states of the obligations they already have to their populations. Now, almost a decade has passed since member states of the United Nations endorsed the principle of responsibility to protect, to protect in the World Summit Outcome document. Since that time, there have been a series of efforts to operationalize the principle based on the implementation plan that was drafted in 2009 by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Most notable among these efforts have been the creation of a joint office in New York for the Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide and the Special Advisor for the Responsibility to Protect, as well as a convening mechanism that would allow these two officials to bring Under Secretaries General of the UN together in a crisis situation. There's also been the establishment of a UN-wide contact group on the responsibility to protect. In addition to these institutional developments, the principle of R2P has been invoked in a variety of concrete situations of crisis, most notably in relation to the Security Council authorized military action against Libya in 2011, which many regarded at the time as a successful invocation of the responsibility to protect. So by the autumn of 2011, the Secretary General was confidently proclaiming by now it should be clear to all that the responsibility to protect has arrived. Despite all these seemingly positive steps, however, there's continuing controversy within international society about how and to what degree the principle should be operationalized. At the same moment that proponents of R2P were heralding a breakthrough for the norm in the Libyan context, 
Others were predicting a backlash against the principle from significant corners of international society. In an article entitled R2P, RIP, meaning rest in peace, journalist David Reif argued that the morphing of NATO's civilian protection mission into a campaign for regime change in Libya had done grave, possibly even irreparable damage to the principle. The statements of key non-Western states in the Security Council in May 2011, which expressed concern about NATO's air campaign, offered further evidence of some of the skepticism that lingers about the principle. And so the question remains, did the endorsement of the responsibility to protect in 2005 catalyze efforts to improve, in concrete ways, upon the international architecture for preventing and responding to mass atrocities. In one sense, it clearly did. In 2006, the Security Council reaffirmed Articles 138 and 139 of the Summit Outcome Document in their resolution on the protection of civilians in armed conflict. In 2009, the General Assembly discussed and accepted the Secretary General's plan to build the capacity necessary to both prevent and respond to the commission of mass atrocity crimes. More broadly, R2P has become part of the world's diplomatic language, invoked by a variety of international actors, including governments, international institutions, and civil society, to both explain, but also to demand action in cases such as Darfur from 2004 to 6, Kenya during its post-election violence in 2008, and more recently in Libya and Syria. But on the other hand, it's worth noting that it took almost half a year of diplomatic energy to achieve that Security Council resolution, a resolution that masked division over the appropriateness of discussing the principle within the Council. And in spite of the inter institutionalization of responsibility to protect, international actors continue to debate what situations are relevant for the application of the norm and what precise actions are entailed by it. Now, to fully understand the nature of this debate, it's important to unpack what has become known as the three-pillar formulation of responsibility to protect that was presented to the General Assembly by Ban Ki-moon in 2009. Pillar one, which draws on pre-existing legal obligations, is the responsibility of individual states to protect their own populations, whether nationals or not, from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. That's pillar one. Pillar two calls upon the international community acting through the UN system and partner organizations to help states fulfill these responsibilities by helping to build capacity for the prevention of these crimes. And finally, pillar three specifies that if the state in question is manifestly failing to protect, UN member states have a residual role and can respond collectively in a timely and decisive manner using the full range of economic, political, and military tools. The Secretary General regularly insists that all three pillars of R2P are of equal weight and that implementation of the principle is multi-layered as an agenda. And it includes consensual as well as coercive means. So R2P in this three-pillar form is a complex norm. It contains more than one prescription. Its structure also creates a situation in which the breach of one of the components, failure on the part of a national government, is meant to act as a trigger for fulfillment of another component, the international community's role in protection. Now, as a result of this formulation, states can debate and have debated whether certain pillars should have greater emphasis, despite the Secretary General's claim about equality. And they also debate when the international community's remedial role has been activated, i.e., when the national government can be said to have manifestly failed. Two brief examples, I think, will highlight how these debates can affect implementation of the principle. First, in terms of the timing of the so-called third pillar, the international community's role, 
Some states have consistently adhered to a hierarchical reading of R2P in which national protection responsibilities are paramount and possibilities for international intervention are severely constrained. So in the case of Darfur, from 2004 to 6, states that oppose the application of sanctions against the government of Sudan insisted that the state had been given insufficient time to live up to its responsibility and that Sudan had not yet demonstrated manifest failure. Second, there's an argument over what situations should be identified as countries of R2P concern, cases where mass atrocity crimes are occurring or imminent. So, for example, in the spring of 2009, at the height of the Sri Lankan government's military assault against the Tamil Tigers, advocates of R2P themselves engaged in a lengthy debate as to whether the approximately 150,000 civilians caught up in the fighting in the jungle area near Mutalivu were being subjected to mass atrocity crimes. On the one hand, the prominent civil society organization, Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect, called upon the Security Council to place the situation on its agenda and to act upon its responsibility. Others, however, insisted that the Sri Lankan government was engaged in an existential battle with terrorists that had threatened all of its citizens for a decade and that its actions were therefore both necessary and proportionate. So how worried should we be about this level of debate? I think some of this contestation is inevitable and not necessarily unhealthy. Norms by their very nature are social facts. They're open to controversy and debate, and they're open to evolution in meaning as they are used. But more generally, I'd suggest that it is false or inappropriate to evaluate the strength of responsibility to protect in terms of whether it generates military intervention in particular cases. First, as I tried to outline to you earlier, responsibility to protect is a complex norm with various prescriptions. These prescriptions apply to national governments as well as to international actors. And the remedial role of the international community is less clearly defined than the legal commitments that states have under Pillar 1. And I hasten to add that this was the way states wanted it to be when they negotiated the text of the 2005 World Summit Outcome Document. Second, whether military intervention occurs or does not occur is not a way to measure the robustness of the principle. Norms only create zones of possibility, of permissibility for certain behavior. They cannot cause it. They cannot force it. One of R2P's core functions as a norm is to emphasize what is appropriate and to shine a spotlight on what is deemed inappropriate. Its strength can be measured to a certain extent by the degree to which notions of protection are invoked by international actors during times of real or imminent crisis. R2P should serve as a catalyst for debate. But exactly what type of action follows on from its invocation will depend on a host of factors, including other important international or norms. At a minimum, I believe what R2P demands is a duty of conduct by members of the international community to identify when crimes are being committed or when there is a threat of commission and to deliberate on how the three-pillar framework might apply. This duty of conduct is particularly demanding for bodies like the UN Secretariat, the Secretary General, or indeed those holding my position or the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, because we do not have the same level of politicization built into our structure as a body like the Security Council. The Security Council will be and is often inconsistent. That is the reality. But the Secretariat, the Human Rights Council, or those in the position of the Special Advisor on the Responsibility to Protect, must ensure that they consistently call attention to the threat or commission of mass atrocity crimes, even while recognizing that the Security Council may act inconsistently. <laughs> 
In the case of Darfur, the Security Council did remain seized of the matter. It explicitly invoked responsibility to protect. It also responded with a range of measures, including sanctions, referral of the situation to the International Criminal Court, and authorization of a peacekeeping mission with a civilian protection mandate. The slow pace of the Council's response and the relatively limited nature of the military deployment was partly a function of the opposition of key states on the Council. No doubt about it. But it was also a result of doubts on the part of Western states as to whether a successful military effort could be mounted, giving competing missions in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the difficulties associated with the terrain in Sudan. There was also genuine concern as to whether such an intervention would actually have destabilizing effects for neighboring countries. So given this balance of consequences, some proponents of the responsibility to protect, including Gareth Evans, who I mentioned earlier, concluded that a military intervention could not be justified. As he put it, it will be the case that some human beings simply cannot be rescued except at unacceptable cost, perhaps of a larger regional conflagration involving major military powers. These words written in 2008 by Gareth Evans have also been used to characterize the crisis in Syria. This outcome does not mean, as some critics of the responsibility to protect suggest, that the principle has failed. Instead, it suggests to me that the precepts of R2P exist alongside other considerations, both normative, such as judging the potential consequences of a military action, and non-normative, the reality of military overstretch. How these factors work together in decision-making to produce an outcome will differ from case to case. Indeed, in a certain sense, inconsistency is built into the very fabric of Security Council action, and, and the outcome document called upon states to act on a case-by-case -case basis. The duty of conduct demands only that atrocity situations be identified and considered, not that there always will be a uniform and consistent response. In some situations, such as Libya in 2011, military action will be deemed both possible and legitimate. In other instances, such as Kenya, following its post-election violence in 2008, targeted sanctions and mediation measures will be deemed more appropriate. But in both cases, the norm of responsibility to protect can be said to be at work. It's also been at work, however imperceptibly it may seem, in the crisis in Syria. States on the border of Syria have accepted refugees. A third of the country's population has been on the move. It has placed great strain on neighboring countries. Actors have also supported humanitarian assistance. They have imposed tough sanctions. And the UN system has also continued its engagement, rhetorically by reminding states of their responsibilities, materially by negotiating and providing, negotiating aid access and providing assistance, diplomatically by pressuring those with influence in the region and those who are involved in fueling the violence to change their behavior, but also to encourage dialogue and inclusiveness. And it's also been engaged legally by creating an evidence base of the crimes committed for efforts to ensure accountability. Indeed, the Human Rights Council of the UN has been very active over Syria through its commissions of inquiry. But the Syria crisis reminds us of the wrenching dilemmas that often face policymakers. More generally, I think it's also drawn attention to some of the principled objections that still linger with respect to the responsibility to protect. I believe it's dangerous to assume that all opponents, or all opposition, I should say, not opponents, but opposition, to the principle is driven by power considerations or misunderstandings about what the norm entails. We must also stop to consider how a norm such as responsibility to protect looks from the perspective of those who are affected by it. 
As I conclude then, I want to consider some of the principal debates, some of the normative considerations that have arisen during the decade-long period of the implementation of the responsibility to protect. By reviewing the written and oral statements that have been made by states within a variety of UN fora, it's possible to tease out a range of objections that have been raised about responsibility to protect in both the lead up to and the aftermath of the 2005 World Summit. On one end of the spectrum, there's no doubt, are those states whose opposition partly stems from their government's own concerns about regime security and the fear that R2P may at some point be directed at their own internal affairs. Coupled with this objection is the common claim that R2P has thus far been applied disingenuously, thereby leaving intervention to the discretion of the powerful. At the other end of the spectrum are states that are very reluctant to embrace a military solution to humanitarian crises for the very legitimate concern about the devastating effects of the use of military force. And they therefore insist on the need for the use of force as a last resort. I think this sentiment has been best expressed by the government of Brazil in its initiative Responsibility While Protecting, which is aimed at reinterpreting responsibility to protect by emphasizing the international community's non-military tools for exercising its responsibilities, by limiting the recourse to force as a last resort, and strengthening the accountability of those who act militarily on behalf of the Council. Underpinning some of the unease around the responsibility to protect, however, is a deeper discomfort with its perceived impact on sovereignty. During the negotiations in 2005, many states, both democratic and undemocratic, sought to ensure that the responsibility to protect reaffirms the, the horizontal distribution of power among sovereign states, rather than creates a hierarchical structure in which the international community has an automatic role in protecting populations. This impulse, while sometimes motivated by purely self-interested concerns, also rests on principles that have played a crucial role in the development of international relations in the modern world, most notably the norm of sovereign equality. As sovereign equals, states have both reciprocal rights and responsibilities, and they participate as peers in the creation of international rules and institutions. And if you want the most vivid evidence of this, just look at the GA of this week and the specter of the most democratic picture we have of all states coming together, um, who, by the way, create complete gridlock on the streets of New York while they do so. But as sovereign equals who have these reciprocal rights and responsibilities, states also participate in cooperative endeavor, endeavors, and they have done so throughout the life of the UN. Sovereign equality facilitates that cooperation, but it also expresses the self-determination of societies across all continents. So even though we know there are deep asymmetries of power in the world, some states are more powerful than others, sovereignty as an idea and sovereign equality as a principle remains an important legal fiction that we rely on. It underpins international law and much of the work of the UN. But the attractiveness of the principle of sovereign equality lies in its broader normative function to create an egalitarian political and legal system at the global level. However, none of this suggests that sovereign equality puts states completely beyond the law. Nor does sovereign equality necessarily entail immunity from international concern or jurisdiction over infringements of standards that have themselves been agreed to by states. States can no longer claim, in the name of sovereignty, a freedom to behave in ways that contradict the very purposes for which the international community respects and protects sovereignty. What the principle of sovereign equality does make more difficult, however, is the creation of a hierarchical system where the conduct of states is subject to oversight and punishment 
by an unaccountable agent at the international level, by the so-called international community, which is faceless. It's this possibility which would potentially enable the strong to impose their conception of justice that I think has motivated some of the deepest concerns about responsibility to protect. The effort to preserve sovereign equality, even if it's a fiction, flows from a deeper desire to maintain diversity and pluralism within our world system. I believe that by continuing to emphasize all three pillars of the responsibility to protect, and by building the capacity of states to protect their populations, we can find a way to secure individuals in a world of states, and to honor the sentiment behind sovereign equality. Through my work to embed responsibility to protect within the UN system, I will continue to emphasize that at its heart, R2P is designed to support states in the fulfillment of their sovereign responsibilities. The principle requires not only effective response to crisis, but also a willingness and capacity to prevent crises from emerging and escalating. Its goal, in the end, is to create resilient, inclusive, and transparent societies that can find their own solutions to achieving the protection of their populations and who can work in partnership with regional and inter international actors in order to ensure that mass atrocity crimes, just like aggressive war, can become a much rarer phenomenon in international politics. This effort involves so much more than the use of military force, which must remain the option of last resort. It also involves many actors beyond the Security Council. Indeed, the imperative to prevent mass atrocity crimes extends to all of us. Citizens of states, particularly in democracies, can play a direct role in shaping the positions of their governments and in pushing for the establishment of national mechanisms dedicated to, to the prevention of atrocity crimes. They can influence how a state addresses a situation of concern, as well as how it relates to its neighbors, regional organizations, and other international partners. The responsibility to protect individuals in a world of states is a multifaceted agenda, which speaks to a variety of actors, including each one of us. The word responsibility is demanding, but we shouldn't shy away from that word. We too bear that responsibility to bear witness, to catalyze action, and to push for accountability. Thanks very much. I'm sure the audience uh, here and on the webcast have many questions for you, and we'll get to those questions in a moment. If you have a question in the audience, please uh, feel free to line up by one of the microphones at the side. And if you're watching by webcast, please feel free to chat a question into the chat window. Uh, but I'll, I'll warm up uh, with a couple of questions of my own. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so one is, uh, what do you think the international community has done particularly well with respect to the responsibility to protect in Syria, and what could we do to, to do a better job of protecting Syrians, given the complexities of the situation on the ground? Well, I think most recently, it has um, done an excellent job of keeping everyone's eyes on the problem that has existed for the past two years, that despite the, the focus on the chemical weapons attack, which was of course horrendous, that there has been two years of suffering that needs to be addressed through a resolution to the crisis. And so it has attempted through a very talented envoy to keep the option of negotiations, however difficult, alive. I think it has also done an excellent job of from the very beginning, and it may seem small consolation, but I see it as very significant, as describing even as early as the summer of 2011 that potentially crimes were being committed and that this was a matter of international concern. 
two decades ago in the Balkans, we didn't do that. It took so long for us to believe as a community that this was a matter of international concern. And very soon after the, the Human Rights Council, a body that I think there were low expectations of what it might necessarily be able to do, actually performed extremely well um, in th through its mechanisms in establishing a commission of inquiry, which has given us an evidence base uh, about what is going on, which is incredibly important for decision makers to act on, but also for accountability. I think as well, uh, more recently, uh, the Secretariat within the UN has been reasonably vocal in reminding the Security Council of its responsibilities. Of course, it cannot force the Council to act. But in strongly suggesting that the Council has failed to exercise its responsibility, I think it is, it is starting a process that may bear fruit. Um, but this, you know, this is a very small consolation, um, I know to some, in terms of the suffering that we see on the ground. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw the other day, uh, there was a an opinion piece, I think it was in The Guardian, but I would have to look it up, uh, it, just in the wake of the Washington shooting. Uh, and the columnist uh, said that the international community had a responsibility to protect American citizens because of the, the widespread death mm. as a result of gun violence, which might have been a little tongue in cheek, or it may have been very serious, mm. but it, it does raise the question, uh, how can the international community uh, claim to promote this principle as a general principle when its application so far has entirely been, at least in its most robust form, in Africa, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, in the Balkans, uh, the powerful seem more or less immune to, still immune to international mm -hmm. intervention, uh, even though in some cases, like in the United States, the levels of death mm -hmm. are significant. Yeah, I mean, I think that speaks to one aspect of the responsibility to protect. As I tried to lay out, in the three pillar format, I think it does, it, it always applies. It applies to all states. It's not that R2P only applies when you get to a certain situation of crisis. All states have these responsibilities. And in the dialogue in the General Assembly two weeks ago on the pillar one dimension of the responsibility to protect, a number of states, including European countries, made statements about the efforts they had taken within their own societies to manage diversity and to manage the risk factors associated with mass atrocity crimes. So the message that no one is immune um, is a very important message. And in that dialogue, there was a sharing of experiences and a recognition that there are actions to be taken at home. But under pillar one, um, we're not talking about coercion from the outside. Um, we're talking about national action. But your question about where coercion is applied, I think, is a very good one. Um, and at the moment, it is applied inconsistently, which is, I will admit, um, difficult for a new norm that's you know, striving to gain legitimacy. But it's important to recognize, as I've tried to do in my remarks, that this is largely a function of the body that has been entrusted with those coercive means, which is the Security Council. I will say that there are possibilities for the General Assembly to act in unusual cases as well, that the fact of council deadlock is not the end of the story. Uh, we have seen in history through the Uniting for Peace resolution that the General Assembly in very rare occasions has demanded action in peace and security. And I understand there's actually some thinking about that. Absolutely. But I think we need to recognize why would it be that states in 2005 wanted the Security Council to be at the heart of the responsibility protects coercive dimension. And I think that is because at the end of the day, it remains a body, however imperfectly, but it remains a body in which collective legitimization for action is possible. So that it is easier to claim that this is not action motivated by the narrow ideological or national interests of one state. That it represents certainly not all world opinion, it's a subset of countries, but that it is a multilateral mechanism. It is certainly imperfect, but that is why I think in 2005 states wanted to ensure 
that that body remain at the center as opposed to allowing states to unilaterally uh, use force. And as a special advisor on the responsibility to protect, what would your special advice be at the moment? On Syria or on... Or in general, <laughs> whichever you prefer. Um, I think my priority, my special advice, is that we need now um, to put a particular emphasis on Pillar 2, on specifying the ways in which the international community can assist states in meeting their obligations through means that are more consensual, whether it be through the human rights machinery of the UN, um, whether through peacekeeping missions, which are um, stationed in a country with host state consent, in which can include re protection responsibilities, through very targeted development assistance and mechanisms like that. I think we need to be very focused now on that level of assistance. Um, but I also th would advise that we continue to be very consistent in our role in the Secretariat and as special advisors in drawing attention to situations of concern, even if coercive action may not be taken by the Council. Very good. Let's uh, go to some questions from the audience, and we'll start with one from a, uh, a viewer on the webcast, uh, sort of an autobiographical question. <laughs> uh, what reception have you experienced with the, within the UN since your appointment as the new special advisor? It's been a very positive reception. I think there is a recognition that the principle has wider appeal, despite the complexities that have been associated with its last decade. Um, there's an interest in the various organs of the United Nations to seeing the ways in which responsibility to protect can affect the work of existing mandates and agendas. Um, so my reception has been positive. At the GA dialogue on September 11th, um, even those states that have um, raised concerns about responsibility to protect in the past um, were constructive in the debate. Uh, and in my bilateral meetings with some of them, uh, they've been willing to listen. So on the whole, it's been a, a good landing, I would say. And no, no negativity? No, not thus oh, far. Very good. I mean, there, you know, there, the, the concerns expressed are concerns um, that I outlined in my remarks um, about the need for us to be specific about what responsibility entails, uh, and concerns about the association of responsibility to protect with military force, which is um, one connection I'm seeking to discuss. And of course it's there, but it's not the sum total of the principle. Yeah, very much so. I should have said, by the way, that question came to us from Gavin Charles in Ottawa. Thank you very much, Gavin. Question here from the audience. Uh, hi. Is it on? Uh, my question starts off with a comment. Uh, first, I'd like to say I uh, truly applaud just the idea that we could uh, have something called the responsibility to protect. And my comment is the way the UN is constituted as of today, I don't truly believe that it's capable of seeing a mission like this through. And I think what's happening in Syria and the Security Council should be evidence that we are still very far from saying that Rwanda will never happen again. So my, that leads me to my question. How far-fetched would it be to say maybe it's time to restructure the United Nations to say the Security Council was put in place after World War II, and that's almost a century ago. Maybe some of those functions need to trickle down to the Secretariat, because I don't see, if we're talking about there's going to be a genocide in country X, and our first approach is diplomacy, I don't see how that correlates. I think some of these, the biggest problems in the United Nations sit with the Security Council. And the Security Council is five 
countries that are part of, that should also be policed like the others. So I, I think we have to do away with the Security Council and say, okay, the UN Secu Secretariat should be the new Sec Security Council. Interesting idea there. Uh, just, just a clarification, there are five permanent members. Yeah. Uh, um, your thoughts on the utility or disutility of the Security Council? I understand your frustration, um, but I don't agree with your cure. Um, but partly because I think we need to remember that the United Nations is created by states. It is a member state organization, and so the, the Secretariat cannot rule in that sense. Um, and the Security Council remains a body created by states. There are many states that support its role in international peace and security. And we have to remember that when the Council is united, it can also muster um, power and influence in situations. I agree that we don't see that all the time, but that possibility is there. Um, so I think the creators of the United Nations in 1945 had a point in that they saw the League of Nations fail because there was an inability to put power at its core to mobilize the powerful states in the international system. The UN was structured such as to solve that problem and essentially bring the great powers into a management role. Now that was the ideal. The practice hasn't always followed suit. Um, but that was, not, that was not a bad principle uh, to begin with. And that's maybe where you and I um, disagree. There has been much discussion about reform of the council. Um, and that's an ongoing discussion, um, including working methods reform, making the council more transparent, um, enhancing its effectiveness. Of course, there's also been discussion about Security Council membership. And I expect those debates to continue um, because an institution does need to evolve um, over time. But I can't see us moving to your interesting solution because of the very nature of the United Nations. I and guess the problem I have, I, what I'm trying to understand is, if we have the Security Council and it's five countries, who really is deciding that this country is behaving badly? That's what I'm trying to get at. It's, mm -hmm. That's part of the problem. That's why you have Russia has an interest in Syria and the United States is saying, but this guy is killing his own people, which is true. So where do you go from there? At the end of the day, the rest of the world is left at the whim of just five superpowers and whatever interest they choose to pursue at the time. So I'm saying we really don't, besides Libya, there has been no intervention militarily in the world of late. And I would say what happened in Libya had more to do with rising gas prices all over the world. If we, had, if we didn't have that, would we have had that intervention in Libya? Mm, I think we would have. Uh, I think there were other factors at play. Yeah, okay. uh, but there has been action uh, in humanitarian situations authorized by the Council over the last 25 years beyond Libya. Um, we don't see it in Syria today. But that's not to say that in the end of what has obviously been a very messy process, that the council won't be at the heart of a political solution, because it is only some of those council members who can put pressure on the parties now in the Syrian conflict to come to the negotiating table. But I appreciate your frustration um, and, and your observations, even if we disagree on the solution. We have a question from Nea Bhatt watching in Washington. Uh, How easy or difficult is it to decouple R2P from regime change in practice? Okay, well, I need to answer this in two parts because in one sense it's very easy to decouple. Uh, the responsibility to protect is about protecting populations under the three pillar framework. It is not about only the use of military force. Um, <coughs> in the kind of action that you suggest through regime change. So it's very, very different. Um, it involves national level responsibilities, assistance to states, and then, um, if all else fails, international action. 
But I think your question is getting at when you use military force to protect civilians, is it possible to do so without changing the regime? I think it is, um, certainly in intent. Uh, and I think this is at the heart of some of the debate over Libya. There are those who say states always intended to overthrow Gaddafi through their action. That may or may not be true, but there's also a possibility that a mission can begin uh, in one way and result in regime change, and that may be what you're, you're getting at. Um, but I believe it is possible, not just in theory, um, to protect civilians, to take actions to protect civilians without ruling on the political choices and outcome, um, as hard as that might be. Uh, and that is at the heart um, of the approach, a, a civilian protection approach that one might take militarily. So I think the two have to be decoupled uh, in practice, but that, that also that they can be. It's probably also worth noting that even though it predated the formal adoption of R2P as a UN principle, um, Kosovo was in effect an R2P mm. operation and it didn't result in mm. regime change, at least not with respect to Syria. Yeah. Question over here. Please identify yourself if you can. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, given that uh, the United States has publicly said that they're supporting the rebels with weapons, um, how does the discussion around uh, arms reduction and just stopping the sale and transfer of weapons into these conflict zones, how does that play out at the UN Security Council? It's an excellent question. I mean, part of what um, the Secretariat is saying is that all countries need to cease fueling the violence um, and has not been supportive of, of plans to arm the rebels. Uh, and so I, I can't predict what the negotiations to the crisis will look like, uh, but that is very much part of the discussion, that that's part of the responsibility of those with influence. Um, so that may be the U.S. position, uh, but it's certainly not been the position of the, of the Secretariat. Thank you. And I, I gather that most of what happens at the Secretariat or at the U.N., we don't hear about, it would be behind the scenes. Well, it's, um, it's quiet diplomacy. Right. Absolutely, it's quiet diplomacy, but sometimes it's not quiet diplomacy. You see uh, the Secretary General, his, his statement to the General Assembly this week um, was a powerful call to states, who, particularly those who have influence, to use that influence. So I think rhetorically um, the role of the UN and various officials within the UN, um, the Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pile, has been very outspoken about the situation in Syria, um, and various organs of the UN have a role to play to remind states of their responsibilities, and I think that's what we see these various entities doing. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, uh, firstly, I'd like to applaud the, the presence of R2P and, and certainly your own role in that at the UN in its reduction of major, major conflicts. What we have seen as a result um, of this more measured approach to conflict is uh, smaller conflagrations, if you like, that, that have led to enormous pressures on uh, the refugee situation, mm -hmm. where they are going in thousands and thousands to neighboring countries throughout the area. And of course, it does seem to be centered on a, a sort of central area of the world. Um, I'm thinking of Jordan in particular. Uh, what is your feeling on, on how this tension between responsibility to protect and measured response um, is vis-a-vis -vis this, this major influx of refugees mm -hmm. everywhere? Well, I think what we've seen, as I suggested in my remarks, is a remarkable exercise of responsibility by Syria's neighbors in taking in refugees. And of course, part of the refugee system at its core is the principle of protection um, of refugees, of internally displaced people. Because the Syrian population that's on the move, some of the displacement is within Syria, um, and some of it is to neighboring countries. So I think it is part of a picture of states exercising their responsibilities. And we need to remind, again, uh, 
uh, of the need to, to grant asylum. Um, we also need to be working actively with populations in those refugee centers with a mindset of prevention. Um, how will they return? What will their views be of those in other communities, other communities of faith, other ethnicities? And working already with an eye to prevent future mass atrocities in Syria that might, um, might be on the table if we don't now seek to create the seeds of inclusiveness later on. And I think that has to be part of the work that we do um, with refugees now. And, and are there UN teams working in that way in, in yes. refugee camps? Yes. Thank you. And, of course, humanitarian organizations and civil mm -hmm. society organizations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Question from uh, another viewer in Washington, uh, Paul Cadario. Does the apparent inability of the United States to use the term R2P in public limit its value in practice? Because it appears that the United States hesitates. Yeah. I think this is a really interesting question because um, in the United States, the emphasis has more been on genocide prevention and mass atrocities. Um, I think partly because it is those principles resonate well um, within the United States. I also think, as I sort of gestured in my remarks, that there is a long-standing and historical reluctance in the United States to be bound in advance, <laughs> to have others decide on when and where it should use force. The idea of creating a responsibility or an international obligation has always been an issue of debate domestically for the US. It goes back to Woodrow Wilson and the signing of the League of Nations Covenant. Um, so it's a long-standing part. But I think we should not be um, too hung up on labels. And I don't see it as detracting the United States has taken under that alternative framing very positive actions domestically to organize its capacity to respond to mass atrocities through the creation of the Atrocities Prevention Board. And so um, it has also declared situations like those I have described, at least President Obama has declared them, as matters that fundamentally affect the national interest of the United States. So there's been great movement in this area even if it's through different language. And I think we, at least someone in my position, but I think generally within the responsibility to protect community, it's probably time now to be less hung up on what precise language is being used and more work um, in a common direction on the prevention and response to the crimes. I think it's understandable for a principal that is young to want uh, to want to be used in precisely the way it was framed. Um, but I don't think we need to worry about that quite as much anymore. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, the Assad regime in Syria being uh, protected, armed by Russia, and now the KGB guy is in charge of peace process. How can we have a trust in the whole thing? Sorry, I didn't understand that last part of the question. Putin now is a peacemaker. How can we have a trust in this? Well, I think the peace process is more than Putin. Um, it's being partially shaped by a special representative of the Secretary General. Um, it obviously is very early days in terms of seeing what will result from it. Um, but there's no question that those with influence in the region um, have to be at the table. And so Russia is a, a state with great influence in the region and with Syria. Um, and it has the potential um, at this moment to make a difference. So um, I don't see it being driven by uh, President Putin uh, solely. I think it's a, a much more multifaceted process than that. It is an interesting issue, though. If I can play devil's advocate here and support Putin a little bit, please don't quote me on this. I hope this isn't being uh, recorded. Uh, we, we dislike the fact that he's been an obstacle to uh, progressive change in a country that we think is overdue for progressive change. But it's not clear to me that all of his uh, objections to more aggressive international action are ridiculous. Uh, mm. So for example, uh, 
uh, he, he says over and over again that whatever we do by way of intervention is going to make a bad situation mm -hmm. worse. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's no sort of alternative center of power available to sort of pick up the pieces and rebuild a functioning state. Uh, he doesn't say it a lot, but very obviously on his mind is the fear that if Assad goes down, um, a lot of radical groups will get their hands possibly on chemical weapons and they might find their way very quickly to Chechnya mm -hmm. and then therefore to the Moscow subway system and so forth and so on. So you can understand mm -hmm. uh, this set of concerns. If, if somebody other than Putin had signed that op-ed in the New York Times, my impression is a lot of people would have said, yes, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's pretty, pretty clear and pretty sensible except for the ridiculous line about the rebels using the, the gas. Right. Well, I think um, even more to the point, if you look at um, the abstentions that were made over Libya and the five states that abstained and you read their statements, they raised very valid concerns about the use of force in Libya. Um, and I agree with you that the kinds of questions the Russians are asking are questions that need to be answered um, about the consequences of the use of force, about uh, the degree to which military means can solve what is at bottom a political issue. Um, and a variety of states, and not just Russia, have asked these kinds of questions. Of course, it's been the loudest voice. Um, and also early on, it was very concerned about a pronouncement on the political settlement coming from the international community. I'm thinking of 18 months ago. It was focused on trying to end violence um, rather than pronouncing on that, on that outcome. So I don't at all see these questions as being ridiculous or inappropriate. They're exactly the right questions to be asking in a calculation that involves dilemmas and trade-offs, right? I mean, it, sure. and, and there is a legitimate debate to be had about what consequences we can foresee from the use of military right. force. And about the dangers of outflanking the Security Council. Oh, yes, absolutely. Right. You know, I mean, the 2005 Summit Outcome doc document clearly states that if there is to be force used under the responsibility to protect principle, it must be through the Security Council. And that is, and that is very clear. Mm -hmm. Do you think the United for Peace resolution could be a way around that or not, in view of the clarity of that? Um, I think in certain instances it could be entertained. Uh, I think that is the predominant wish, um, but given that uh, the General Re Assembly also has a role, not the primary role in peace and security, we need to think about the situations in which that might be the case. I mean, interestingly, the General Assembly has been very active on Syria, mm -hmm. and it passed a very, it issued a very strong statement, actually criticizing the Security Council not long ago, uh, of not living up to its responsibilities. So I can't foresee exactly how it would happen in this instance, but I think as a principle we should not forget that that option exists and it has been used in history. Very good. Question on this side. Hi there. Uh, my name is Matt Redding. I'm a former student uh, from here at the Bolsa Lee School and currently working with the Security Governance Group also here in Waterloo. Um, my question concerns uh, the responsibility while protecting concept mm -hmm. that you allude mm -hmm. to in your, in your presentation. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Brazil took the lead in promoting this uh, in 2011, uh, 2012, after, in the aftermath of the Libya intervention, and it really highlighted uh, a lot of the popular concerns and legitimate concerns with the R2P concept. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they've since stepped back from promoting the issue. So I'm wondering if uh, you can shed some light on any possible movement in perhaps picking up where Brazil left off in promoting the RWP concept. Um, or whether there's sort of, or I guess in general, on the potential for the R2P norm evolving to reflect some of these uh, popular concerns? Um, it's a very good question. I think that that initiative was very constructive. Uh, in the, initially, I think some states were worried that it might um, create a backsliding with respect to the responsibility to protect. I didn't see it that way and I don't see it that way. I think the issues that Brazil raised, and I think the fact that Brazil raised them, a country that is not only an emerging power, but a country that believes in a strong multilateral system and a rules-based system, I think is very significant. Um, 
two weeks ago in the, in the dialogue in the General Assembly, there was a few references to Brazil's initiative um, and support for that initiative. I think there would be appetite for Brazil moving forward um, to flesh it out a bit more, either alone or in concert with like-minded states. I haven't seen anything recently, um, but I will say I would welcome their efforts to do so, and I would be very open to working with them in doing, in doing that, because I think it was a constructive intervention in the debate, particularly around the need for those who act on the Council's behalf to be accountable. Um, and for the UN system to engage in better assessment uh, preventively. So both of those things, I think, are part of what needs to be, um, which needs to be central to the evolution of responsibility to protect. Thank you. Uh, Fen Hampson uh, with CG. Uh, first, uh, Jennifer, let me uh, com congratulate you on a excellent uh, presentation, which is, which are, as our chair said, was uh, extremely lucid on a very complex issue. Uh, my, uh, my question for you really has to do with uh, the role of regional organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it can be argued that uh, regional organizations, uh, uh, to the extent that uh, R2P has been implemented, um, have been critical players, not just as enforcers, as in the case of NATO and Kosovo, uh, but also as uh, legitimizers. Uh, you know, Resolution 1973 on Libya uh, would have not, not have uh, even uh, gotten past first base. I think it's fair to say in the Security Council, had not there been two uh, successive resolutions coming out of the o, uh, African Union and the Arab League, uh, which really uh, gave uh, some members of the Security Council cover uh, to either abstain uh, or, in some cases, support the resolution, even though they weren't prepared to uh, lead from the front, uh, <coughs> preferring, as you know, to lead from behind. But. Um, uh, you know, is, is it a fair proposition to say that, uh, you know, R2P, as we've seen it uh, been implemented in recent years, really has uh, depended uh, critically on uh, the role of regional organizations and not just successive resolutions passed by the Security Council? That's my question for you. And then uh, a supplementary question, if I'm allowed. Um, given all of the challenges, which I think you rightly identified in terms of R2P. We're seeing a lot of talk now about prevention, the responsibility to prevent. Um, uh, you know, we've been talking about prevention uh, for the better part of 20 years. I uh, haven't seen a whole lot of it. Uh, you know, is that uh, any kind of substitute for uh, protection and military intervention of the kind that you talked about? Mm -hmm. No, I, I absolutely agree with your assessment of the Security Council resolutions over Libya and regional organizations being important legitimizers, I think they're also crucial uh, <coughs> providers of information uh, about a region and about the likely effects of different courses of action. Um, but I think they also play a hugely important role in prevention, which is your second question. That if you, of course, regions are, have different levels of capability, as you know, know better than I. Um, but if a more effective system of early warning is to emerge, I think it will be built on the back of some of the work of regional organizations. I'm thinking particularly in West Africa with ECOWAS, um, that there needs to be much greater collaboration between um, international organizations like the UN and regional organizations. They're absolutely critical uh, to... to um, the progress of the principle. That being said, I think the fact that there are capacity gaps um, is troubling. And I think Mali showed, showed this, um, that despite wanting um, the African Union to take the lead at various points, that wasn't possible. Uh, and so I think we need to look more at why that's the case and enhancing that capability, which is, which is a job that can be done with patience and hard work. Um, but we aren't there 
uh, at the same level of capability uh, in all regions. On prevention, I agree that we've been looking at prevention for more than 20 years, and I'm thinking back at the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict. And one of the th distinctions I think we need to make is that the prevention of conflict and the prevention of mass atrocities are not exactly the same thing. That these atrocities often occur in the context of conflicts, but not always. Um, and some of the me mechanisms that you might take to prevent um, use tools that already exist, but very differently. Uh, and I'm thinking potentially of mediation here or sanctions. I think your question was getting more at what's sometimes called root cause prevention, unless I'm wrong. Um, and, do we, and do we understand enough about how to act much further back in time to prevent risk factors from turning into situations of crisis? Uh, I think the answer there is I haven't seen a great deal of advancement. Uh, but there's some very good work, academic work being done in this area now to get a lot smarter about the risk factors. And some of that knowledge is translating into the policy world. There's a huge imperative and interest in prevention. And I think some of the more operational tools that exist closer to crisis, further back from root cause, we have seen some important improvements in. Um, and that's an area in which I wish uh, to work. And so I'm slightly more optimistic about prevention, uh, but I recognize exactly the point you make, that we've been concerned about it for a long time, but there's too, too little resources and too little political will that's invested in prevention, uh, and that has to change. Very interesting question uh, from online viewer Sebastian Clark in Waterloo, who asks, do you see natural disasters as ever falling under the ARP 2P doctrine? Yeah, interesting question. I mean, this was something that I think the original ICAS, uh, ICISS um, report grappled with. Um, and it was part of what I was raising with respect to Cyclone Nargis. Responsibility to protect, as it is currently understood, is about the commission of these particular crimes. Um, so unless a situation of natural disaster led to or fostered those crimes, I think we wouldn't say um, that the responsibility to protect applied in that third pillar sense. Um, nonetheless, I think it's worth saying that natural disasters can create conditions which make the risk factors for mass atrocities more acute. And so we should be looking at the aftermath of those situations and asking ourselves whether things are in place to ensure that society is resilient enough to resist the exacerbation of some of those risk factors. But as it currently stands, I can't see the principle being invoked to respond to a natural disaster. It has really been designed to apply to these mass atrocity crimes. With your permission, we'll take two more questions from the audience, if that's Yeah, right. that's fine. Uh, Terry Moran, if it should turn out that the rebels in Syria are the ones that were responsible for the gas attack mm -hmm. that more or less set everything off, would the UN at that time consider uh, military aid to Assad's government to try to put that in place to the same extent that you would the other way. Interesting counterfactual. Hmm. I don't know quite what you mean about the UN. Do you mean the Security Council or do you mean... Um, yes. I can't prejudge what the Security Council would do. Um, I think what the Secretary General has said is that whoever has carried out the attack and the report certainly indicates that the attack occurred, but whoever carried out the attack has committed a war crime and has to be held accountable. Um, it doesn't suggest a military strike um, against them or the kind of support you're suggesting. Whether the council would decide on that, um, I can't prejudge. Um, the current configuration leads me to think that would be unlikely, 
but I can't prejudge. It's an interesting counterfactual. But I think the important point is um, that accountability for those crimes um, must occur. Uh, in, and we need to find out who ultimately was responsible and seek accountability. And, and the accountability would be balanced irregardless of which side? It should be. Okay. It should be, in my view. It should be. Thank I don't think there's actually much question about who used the chemical weapons. That seems fairly clear. The question is how far up the chain of command did the order come from? But it was clearly from within the Assad government. But uh, various rebel groups clearly are guilty of atrocities mm -hmm. and large-scale human rights violations mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. Assad's troops and against each other and against mm -hmm. civilians. So it's not a situation where anybody has clean hands. Exactly. And this is why, uh, as I suggested to you, as much as the world looks at the United Nations and, and says, you know, parts of the United Nations are failing to live up to their responsibilities, part of what United Nations agencies are doing is very important in trying to collect information and evidence about these acts. It's a painstaking process, but it is part of that process of recognizing um, atrocities uh, having been committed by a variety of actors in the conflict. It's an important role to play. Right. We'll take one last question over here. Uh, Tina Mangat, first year PhD student at the Paul Silly School. Um, first of all, thank you very much for a wonderful introduction to R2P. Um, I guess this is more of a procedural question. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess what I'm interested in finding out is what is the threshold or, dare I say, the red line at which R2P becomes um, something that the Security Council starts considering? How many, I guess, to put it very bluntly, how many people have to die? Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, I think the American issue that Dr. Welch brought up, a lot of people have died in gun violence in the U.S. or um, the LGBT folks in Russia are suffering under the Putin regime, dare I say. Um, or, you know, people have died, a lot of people have died in Kenya, of course, uh, not comparative to uh, some of the other places where action, uh, where the R2P question has come up. So I guess, when does R2P come into play when, uh, yeah, I guess, like I said, how many people have to die or how, at mm -hmm. what point mm -hmm. do the Security Council consider a case that this is a situation in which we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to protect? Good question. Um, I don't want to be pedantic, but I just need to say again, responsibility to protect always applies. It applies to each and every member state of the international community to protect its populations. It always applies. So what you are asking me is when does the third pillar of the responsibility to protect, meaning the international community's responsibility to act when nation states are not fulfilling their responsibilities, when does that kick in? I think it kicks in not when some magic quantitative threshold is reached, but when there is an assessment that a, a crime against humanity, a war crime, um, ethnic cleansing, or genocide has occurred or is imminently about to occur. Uh, and it may be that the council will seek to act preventively, and so it will have to make a probabilistic assessment of a crime uh, based on either lower level uh, physical integrity violations, killings, of again, that cannot be quantified, an assessment has to be made. It's a judgment. But it is based on the notion of looking for evidence of crimes, that the scope has now been defined in those terms. So you need to believe that war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, or ethnic cleansing are about to occur, and that the state in question cannot or will not avoid those actions or prevent them from happening. And that is when that third pillar kicks in. And I hasten to add, even when it kicks in, it doesn't mean you start sending bombs into that country. You may decide to take other kinds of action. And so, for example, following the electoral violence in Kenya in 2007, 2008, the international community, not through the Security Council, but through an AU-sponsored initiative, sent Kofi Annan to Kenya to moderate and mediate a solution to the crisis 
to avoid more deaths because we had seen roughly 1,200 deaths in the violence. And the goal at that point was to prevent escalation, further death. And it was done not through military means. It was done through mediation and the application of pressure against certain parties to the conflict. So I want to emphasize again <laughs> that there are non-military tools here and that the responsibility to protect is about more than Pillar 3. The responsibility of each state is so important to reiterate here um, because it is the building block of the principle. It is the recognition that all states have that responsibility that is part of their sovereign rights and responsibility. So I'm sorry if I'm slightly <laughs> pedantic, but I wanted to make sure that, we, that I answered you in, in those terms. But your question is excellent um, because... It highlights how, how judgment is part of this uh, and always will be. Well, Jennifer, let me uh, thank you on behalf of everyone here for really an outstanding uh, tour, de, tour de force here tonight on a very complicated uh, subject. I, for one, am very gratified uh, to see that the Office of Special Advisor for R2P is in such good hands. And I'm especially gratified that it's in Canadian hands. I hope you don't mind that we continue to claim you as Canadian. I would love it if Canada at the moment had a representative on the Security Council to be discussing this important issue at this important time, and I'm, I'm sad that we do not. And uh, I would also love it if uh, Canada um, spoke as much about the responsibility to protect and uh, promoted it as much now as we did at the outset um, when we claimed a certain paternal right to it. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to have you in that position and uh, I'm sure I speak for everyone in, in saying that we've really enjoyed and benefited from your comments here tonight. Um, before I let you go, I will of course thank the audience, uh, both here and online, for spending time with us uh, tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And uh, the video from tonight's live webcast uh, will be edited. My comments on Putin will be removed. And uh, posted online. No, they won't be removed. Uh, they'll be posted on CG's website shortly. Uh, if you're interested in discussing this event, uh, please visit the CG blogs on CG's website, where in a couple of days you will see uh, an opportunity to continue the conversation. Our next events here in the CG Auditorium will be as follows. Tomorrow, September 26th at 7 p.m., renowned American economist Fred, Fred Bergston will discuss currency wars and reform of the international monetary system. On October 21st, we will screen the second movie in the CG Cinema series. 7 p.m., we'll be showing the 2013 film Money for Nothing, Inside the Federal Reserve. And on October 23rd, CG Senior Fellow Paul Bluestein will discuss his new book, Off Balance, International Institutions and the Global Financial Crisis. And that event also starts at 7 p.m. Be sure to register for CG events uh, uh, through and for, and consult the newsletter, CG Newsletter, for information on all of our other upcoming uh, activities, including our new CG Cinema series. So thank you again to CG's event sponsor, Woodsworth Books, for making uh, tonight possible. Thank you all for coming, and please have a safe trip home.